I'm Dan Wilczek, a member of the Board of Directors for BHA, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to BHA's first John Matthew Black Program of 2022. I want to thank the Apostle Islands Historic Preservation Conservancy for its generous support of today's program. Robert Silbernagel was the editorial page editor of the Daily Sentinel newspaper in Grand Junction, Colorado for 19 years. He retired in 2014, but he continues to write a regional history column for the newspaper. Mr. Silbernagel was also the author of several books, including Troubled Trails, The Meeker Affair and the Expulsion of the Utes from Colorado, and Historic Adventures on the Colorado Plateau. Mr. Silbernagel has written articles for various periodicals, including the Wisconsin Magazine of History. The program is about his latest book, The Cadots, A Fur Trading Family on Lake Superior, which was published by the Wisconsin Historical Society Press in 2020. The book won a silver medal for best regional nonfiction from the Independent Publisher Book Awards for 2021. This book is tailor-made for a John Matthew Black program. It's about the greatest economic engine in this area before the advent of the local timber industry. It's about the Voyagers, a group of hardy outdoorsmen who transported the furs and goods on the area's rivers and Lake Superior. And it's about a family with deep ties in the local area, the Cadots, who work with the British, the French, the citizens of that newly formed country, the United States of America, and the native peoples of this area in facilitating the fur trade in the Lake Superior region. I've read the book, and it's a fun and informative read. And if tonight's program piques your interest, copies are available at the Apostle Islands Booksellers. Now, Mr. Silbernagel. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks to the Bayfield Her Heritage Association for putting this together and allowing me to speak via Zoom. As Dan said, I'm going to talk about the fur business, my interest in the fur trade, as well as my interest in Lake Superior and the Kadat family. Well, people ask why I chose to write this book since I live in Colorado and uh, it's not exactly the same as Lake Superior, but my wife, Judy and I both grew up near Madison. We visited Lake Superior as children and we visited many times over the past 25 years, especially the Bayfield and Madeline Island areas. This drawing shows Bay, uh, Madeline Island in the early 19th century, the village of La Pointe, um, with the church in the background and the warehouse with a small ship by it right in the bay there. We also visited other parts of Lake Superior from Thunder Bay to Sault Ste. Marie, and as we traveled, we bought books about the area and the fur trade. And I found that the name Kadat appeared often in the journals and documents of the fur trade era. I grew intrigued and then obsessed about finding out more about the family and about the fur trade. And that obsession led me to write the book that we're talking about today, as Dan said, published by the Wisconsin Historical Society Press in 2020. It took me about 10 years to research and write the book. Part of that time, I was still employed full-time at the newspaper, but after 2014, when I retired, I was able to spend more time research and writing the book. That involved a lot of live visits to the region, as well as researching books, journals, and other written documents. And as I said, I found that the name Kadat appeared often in the written um, record, but also on the landscape in places like this. This is a plaque near Grants Point on Madeline Island where Michel Cadot and his, and his Ojibwe wife, Ikwesawe, also known as Madeline, for whom Madeline Island was named, where they had their fur trade post, their family home, and their family farm for roughly 40 years. 
It became one of the most important locations in the western end of Lake Superior for travelers, fur traders, military, and others. There's also other evidence of the Kadats in other locations. Michel Kadat's gravesite is in the Catholic Cemetery on uh, Madeline Island. Additionally, I'm sure many of you know there's a town of Kadat in northwestern Wisconsin. So the Kadats kept appearing even when I wasn't specifically conducting research about them. And I became more and more intrigued with who they were, how they were involved in the fur trade, and the Lake Superior region. So I conducted quite a bit of research with the written documents, as I said, but also some firsthand experience, such as snowshoeing and hiking on trails that we're pretty sure the Kadats would have traveled on, or kayaking on parts of Lake Superior where they would have gone with their canoes. I don't consider myself a great adventurer, and I wasn't trying to recreate explicitly what they experienced in the late 18th and early 19th century. But as I write about things, I like to get a feel for the landscape where my subjects lived and worked, try to experience a little bit more of their lives and to understand better the fur trade experience. To that end, I also talked to others who were engaged in activities that the Kadats might have been engaged in, such as making maple sugar, trapping beaver and other animals, and gathering wild rice. And I also talked with a number of Kadat descendants who are alive today. In addition to looking at the Kadats, I began researching the fur trade industry. And I learned that hats made of beaver felt from beavers such as these North American beavers created fortunes for fur traders and merchants throughout North America and in Europe as well. The first written reference we have that still exists anyway to beaver felt hats is from Geoffrey Chaucer in the late 1300s. He said that one of his pilgrims in the Canterbury Tales wore a Flemish beaver hat. Well, since that book was written before large numbers of Europeans began to colonize North America. The beaver felt hat that the pilgrim wore in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales probably came from Russia or Scandinavia. But they were, by the time of the Europeans began to colonize North America in large numbers, the Eurasian beavers were pretty much trapped to the brink of extinction. So the finding the North American beaver was critical to the economies of various places. I've tried to get a handle on how many beaver may have been trapped and killed during the heyday of the fur trade, and it's really nearly impossible, but I did make a guesstimate. I looked at some records from the Hudson's Bay Company, the Northwest Company, and I think that over roughly 300 years, there may have been as many as 300 million beaver killed and trapped. Now, compared to that, to the slaughter of bison in North America in the 19th century, when uh, experts say there were 30 to 60 million American buffalo or bison slaughtered. So a lot of beaver went into the industry to making hats. And you may wonder why beaver instead of other animals? Well, it turns out that the fur that protects beaver so well also makes great hats. There are tiny barbs in the under fur of the beaver that interlock, and that creates a felt that holds together better than almost any other animal, is nearly waterproof, flexible, and durable. Now, I don't know what the hat that Chaucer's Pilgrim wore looked like, but we do know that many different styles of beaver felt hats developed over the centuries. And this slide shows several military hats and one clerical hat in the top half of the slide, and then a number of fashionable men's hats in the bottom half. But it wasn't just men that wore felt hats. There were also women's felt hats. This drawing from 1830 shows the woman with the felt hat in the center and a long flowing ribbon behind it. We tend to think that women at that time wore only bonnets or flowered hats, but they also wore ones such as the one pictured in this drawing. Even so, most of the beaver killed for hats went into men's stylish hats. It wasn't just around Lake Superior that the fur trade was active, and it wasn't just Euro-Americans. There were French, British, Americans, French Canadians, Spaniards, Mexicans, and many, many different Native Americans who were involved in the fur trade. 
And the trade at one time covered much of the Atlantic seaboard. The Plymouth Rock Colony was involved in fur gathering and fur trade. Uh, the Dutch in New York, as far south as Virginia. But the animals in those areas were soon trapped out or shot nearly to extinction. So those areas went to other activities, such as agriculture and industry. However, the fur trade, the trapping of beavers, remain the primary economic driver for what we now know as Canada for several hundred years. And the demand for felt hats drove the search for beaver from the East Coast to the West Coast and the Rocky Mountains where I live now. It involved big companies like the Hudson's Bay Company, the Northwest Company, the American Fur Company, and the Rocky Mountain Fur Company. But it also involved small independent companies and independent traders who sold directly to the larger companies. Well, I mentioned the fur trade in the Rocky Mountains and I've done a fair amount of research on the fur trade here. And it's interesting to note that the heyday of the fur trade in the Rocky Mountains lasted a little over 20 years, roughly from 1820 to 1840 when the last great Green River rendezvous was held. Compare that with the fur trade around Lake Superior and the Great Lakes, which lasted almost 200 years. Well, the business was more than just trappers, more than just men like Jim Bridger, the man on the left here, or his colleague, Kit Carson. It also involved people like Sir Alexander Mackenzie, the man on the right. Mackenzie was knighted after he became the first European to cross North America um, from the East Coast to the West Coast. And he reached the Pacific Ocean overland in 1793. That's 12 years before Lewis and Clark made their famous voyage of discovery. Mackenzie also became the first European to reach the Arctic Ocean by an inland route. And today we know that route as the Mackenzie River. But Mackenzie was not just an explorer. He's also deeply involved in the fur trade business. He employed the Kadat brothers and many other traders in his companies at different times. In a journal he wrote about the fur trade business, he explained why he called it a very heavy business. For instance, he said in 1798, the company lost 40,000 pounds shipping furs to China. That's because the British East India Company charged huge tariffs to use their ships to ferry the furs and other goods to China. Later, the Northwest Company that Mackenzie worked for and was a partner in had their own ships. Additionally, he talked about and others have talked about the fact that there was an entire financial lending industry that developed in Europe and North America just to serve the fur trade. But on the ground, the backbone of the fur trade, um, the laborers who did most of the work were voyagers, primarily French Canadians, some French Canadians mixed with Native American blood. They trapped and traded for furs and food. This shows them canoeing on Lake Superior um, in the large Montreal canoes that could carry up to a dozen men and several tons of trade goods or furs. They also drank and ate heartily. They often lived with and married Native American women. They lived a tough life, but many said they loved it and wouldn't change that life for anything. Well, they canoed where they could because it was much easier to get stuff from one point to another on the water, but that still meant portages around falls, rapids, and other obstacles. And when they had to portage, then the voyagers got out and they had to pack the furs or other trade goods. Over long portages, sometimes like the eight and a half mile Grand Portage that goes from the west end of Lake Superior to today's boundary waters in Minnesota. The beaver pelts and others in the back country were pressed in wooden screw presses to make bundles or packs, and usually they were roughly 90 pounds. The voyagers nearly always carried at least two of the 90 pound packs, even on the long portages like the Grand Portages. Some voyagers bragged they could carry three or even four packs. That'd be 360 pounds. So they must have had sturdy backs, strong legs, and thick necks. It's interesting to note that this particular drawing was made by a young artist named Frederick Remington before he moved out west and became a famous Western artist. 
trapping required traps and the best device was a steel leg hold trap. The Native Americans before Europeans used a variety of traps and snares, nets under the ice, snares and deadfalls, and spears and bows and arrows to kill beaver and other animals. But metal traps arrived in North America soon after the first Europeans, probably in the early 1600s. They could be easily transported and hidden beneath the snow or soil and staked underwater to drown the animals. And that's why they became so popular with those in the fur trade. Contemporary writings from fur trade posts and journals show that metal traps were almost always among the goods used to trade with Native Americans in the backcountry and to supply Euro-Americans who were trapping. They've kind of fallen out of favor in a lot of places. My state of Colorado outlawed lake hold traps in 1996, except in special situations when used by licensed trappers. But I know a number of states, Utah and I think still Wisconsin, still allow the use of lake hold traps to capture animals, and so does most of Canada. Many creatures were trapped, not just beaver or shot for their furs. Um, there were marten, lynx, bear, fox, wolf, deer, and moose. It's clear from the records that beaver were far and away the number one. Some of the records I've looked at show that the number of beaver pelts outpaced the other next closest one by a factor of at least 10 to 1. Meanwhile, trappers weren't just Europeans and Americans. There were also lots of Native Americans who were involved. And they traded their furs for European and American goods, such as guns, cloth, tobacco, pots and pans, traps. And they often partnered with traders like the Kadats, or they worked with independent trappers and traders to sell their furs to bigger companies. Well, that's a little bit about the animals that were so critical to the fur trade. Now let's circle back to talk about hats. And in this slide, I'm talking about cowboy hats that were made from beaver felt that evolved from Spanish sombreros. And the photo on the left shows a number of cowboys with different styles of cowboy hats that developed over the years. And on the right is a man who really perfected the cowboy hat named John B. Stetson in Texas. Beaver cowboy hats, like other styles of hats, were popular because they were extremely durable and they offered great protection in the rain, snow, and desert sun. But despite the popularity of cowboy hats, the most popular hat in the West in the late 19th century was a bowler or derby. That's according to historian Lucian Beebe, who looked at hundreds of early photos of outlaws, lawmen, cowboys, and others and found that the majority were wearing derbies. But they were also made of beaver felt and also were extremely durable. Well, despite what was happening in the American West, the most important style of beaver hat for many years was the top hat. As the gentleman in the right, city official from Baltimore in the early 20th century is showing, top hats are still used today, especially in Britain for special ceremonial wear. They came into prominence in the late 18th century, and the photo or the drawing on the left shows a couple of French dandies from the late 18th century. The one on the right is wearing a cockade hat, but the one on the left holds one of the new styles of top hats. Well, many companies made hats since there was such a demand for them. It became a major European industry with companies in England, France, Spain and Holland, all making hats, shipping them all over Europe, to Asia, to the Caribbean, to South America, and to North America. Later, American companies began to make hats as well. One company still working today, Christie's and Company of England, has been making hats for almost 250 years. Making hats was hard work, but it was also very dangerous. And Lewis Carroll's Mad Hatter is a representative of this. The expression developed mad as a hatter because hat makers often drooled, trembled, talked to themselves, and had bouts of paranoia. That's because the mercury used in hat making caused many issues, including brain, nerve, lung, and kidney damage. The United States banned mercury in hat making in 1941. Despite all this, despite all the changes in men's hat styles, 
Beaver and felt hats are still important today. The stamp on the left shows that beaver were an important emblem of Canada, not quite like the maple leaf, but still important for a long time. And up to 135,000 beaver are trapped each year in Canada to this day, uh, as well as quite a few in the United States. Although they were nearly wiped out in many areas, conservation efforts have restored them in most places in North America. Additionally, people are still buying beaver felt hats like this fedora. This one will set you back about $300. Now I'd like to uh, read a passage from my book about Michel Cadat and his wife. It's from chapter 19, A Method to Their Marriage. Nothing in the record of Michel Cadat's life suggests that he was impetuous or that he and his partner Equesaway were prone to making spur of the moment decisions. So when they decided to get married in a Catholic church in 1830, more than 40 years after they first became husband and wife under Ojibwe custom, they must have had a good reason. In fact, they had multiple reasons to have their marriage recognized under European American rules. Notably, important court cases were changing how marriage between European men and Native women were viewed by authorities. Treaties had been forged that made marriage issues more significant for mixed ancestry couples like the Kadads. And substantial cultural changes were on the horizon as the first of the Protestant missionaries began to arrive at Lake Superior. It became apparent that Michel and Equesawe were responding to the changing circumstances of their world. They were demonstrating the same adaptability and resiliency they had shown at different periods in their lives when situations demanded change. It's that ability to adapt to political changes and cultural changes, to step from one world to another, that so intrigued me about the Cadats and other French Canadian traders. And it's what led me to write this book. I'll try and answer any questions you have. We uh, have a couple of questions. Some questions. So the Kadats were trusted by the French, the British, and the Americans, and, and various tribes. How did they earn that trust? It goes back quite a ways. The first Kadats involved in the fur trade were um, friends with the French, or were actually French themselves, French natives who had moved over here. But by the time Michel Kadat's father was involved, Jean Baptiste Kadat Sr., he had worked first with the French and then with the British and developed a reputation in the Sault Ste. Marie area for taking care of um, first a French fort and then a British fort. And then he also worked with Ojibwe and other members of other tribes during the American Revolution to side with the British. Um, and he was a very good interpreter, interpreting Ojibwe primarily, but some other native languages to French and to British, and uh, developed a reputation of being someone they could trust. And I think Jean-Baptiste Cadat Jr., the son, was also very good at interpreting, and he developed a reputation for that as well. Michel Cadat was not as much an interpreter. His language skills didn't seem to be as adept as the others, but still he became well-known for his hospitality at Madeline Island, and someone you could trust as a trader, someone to provide safe passage at the west end of Lake Superior. Did you get a sense of how much success was attributed to his wife? Yeah, I think there is quite a bit. I should have mentioned that. They, all of the Kadats had uh, family ties to the Ojibwe tribe, either through marriage or through their own bloodlines. But Michelle married Equesawe, and she was the daughter of an important leader on Madeline Island in the late 18th century, and also to some of the leaders in the mainland of Wisconsin, northwestern Wisconsin, some of these Ojibwe leaders. And that very definitely helped Michel establish himself as a trader who worked with the Ojibwe and gave him a strong voice when trading with and working with the Ojibwe of northern Wisconsin and northern Minnesota. Dorothy Wolden uh, asked, didn't Native folk do the vast majority of the trapping? Didn't Native people do the vast majority? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, I, I, you know, there's no written documentation about that, but most of the traders like Kadat would go out in the winter and establish a winter post and bring a number of voyagers with them who would then do some trapping in the winter. But most of the furs they gathered came from Native Americans who trapped them themselves and then came in to the winter post to trade with people like the Kadat to get um, European goods in exchange for their furs. Uh, like I said, I don't know exactly what the numbers would be, but it was huge. Did your research indicate how dependence on trade goods changed the Native culture? That's an interesting and sometimes difficult question. Natives certainly became dependent on European goods, guns, muskets, those Native American groups that got guns early had a distinct advantage over other Native American tribes that did not have guns. Metal pots and pans, traps, different clothing. But one of the things my research found and several other authors have written about and it's important to remember is even though Natives began to really value these European items, European and American items, they didn't really change their way of life significantly until the mid-19th century when treaties from the Americans and up north in Canada forced them onto reservations and kind of forced them to abandon a more travel-oriented, more seasonal lifestyle where they traveled a lot more. Until the mid-19th century, so through several hundred years of European American fur trade, they still maintain their basic lifestyle that they had before European contact. Uh, April asked, what was the Kadat's hardest struggle? Well, if we're talking about Michel in Equesawe, I think it was just a constant struggle with a changing political landscape. And that was probably the hardest came around the time of the War of 1812, when shortly before that, there were some changes. Michel Cadat, who had, had worked directly with the Northwest Company, had to give up that activity and begin working with a um, kind of a hybrid British and American company, and later the American um, Fur Company, owned by John Jacob Astor. You know, he had been a loyal British subject for most of his life. He was born just shortly after the British took control of what's now Canada from the French, and he had dealt with British authorities and British merchants all of his life. And then he had to switch that loyalty, I guess, and that economic activity to Americans. And he had to become an American citizen in order to legally trade south of the Canadian border. So that was probably the most difficult time from my perspective. But there were other individual incidents when um, one of his wintering posts was destroyed and most of the furs taken. There were encounters with Dakota Native Americans that could have been much more tragic, but they were able to use diplomacy to avoid violence. Um, I think a lot of different times in his life, but I think the change from the British to the Americans was probably the most difficult for them. Going back to the town of Kadat then, can you expand on the reason Kadat, Wisconsin was given that name? Was there a direct relation to the Kadat family and that location? Very near that location, one of the Kadats, and it was either one of the sons of Michel and Equesue, or perhaps a nephew from Jean-Baptiste Kadat Jr.'s family, had a trading post on the uh, Chippewa River near where the town of Kadat is now um, for a number of years. And, and that is the reason I've read from several sources that the town uh, received that name. So did Michelle have any children and do you have any information about that? I think they had nine children, uh, most of whom lived to adulthood, several daughters who married American fur traders and then became Lyman Warren, actually took over the 
um, Madeline Island fur business from Michel and Equace Way. Um, they had a number of other sons, two at least, probably three that were involved in the War of 1812 on the British side. Most became Americans after word. At least one that we know of moved to Canada, and that's um, and he remained a Canadian citizen. Several important grandchildren, the most famous of whom was William Warren, who became a state lawmaker or territorial lawmaker when Minnesota was a territory. A couple of his sisters became important. Uh, they were teachers, and they also worked with early 20th century historians and ethnographers to talk about the Ojibwe, the fur traders. Um, they had a long line there and then descendants yet from them also were involved. Um, one in the Civil War, that, well, several in the Civil War, serving in the Union Army and others that were in the lumber industry and, and maintained you know, some involvement in the fur trade, even after the business had gone down hill quite a bit. So a long line involved in, in up into the 20th century, definitely. I had a couple of questions about the Kadats having deals with the Bongo family. I am aware that they, they had some involvement. I didn't explore it in any detail. I can't give you a lot of information about it, but I, I know that uh, there was some connection there in the primarily the mid part of the 19th century. You know what languages they spoke and what language Michelle and his wife spoke together? Several people who visited Madeline Island when they still operated the fur trade post there said that Equesaway spoke nothing but Ojibwe. Michelle and Equesaway almost certainly spoke Ojibwe at home, and their children learned to speak Ojibwe first. Michelle also spoke French fluently, as you might expect for somebody who went to school in Montreal for a number of years. He also spoke some English, but it's, it's not clear how, how uh, good his English skills were. But at least one traveler who stopped at Madeline Island when they were operating the fur trade post talked of Michel answering him in English. The, the person was an American who spoke only English. So Ojibwe number one, French number two, and English to some extent number three. Did you run across any evidence? And if not, do you have a perspective from your research, the Kadat's relationship to the conservation of fur bearing animals? No, I didn't run across any evidence that they were, that that was something on their radar. The, it was strictly an industry and it was try and get as many as possible. Now there are other, I've read journals from others in the early to mid 19th century who talked about the dearth of animals, not just beaver, but also um, white-tailed deer, bear, and other animals in northern Wisconsin in the early 19th century. Concerns were raised about that. Sure, the Kadats were familiar with that, were aware of that. How they discussed it and what their thoughts on it were, I don't know. Um, and that, I guess, brings about one point I should have mentioned earlier. This was an interesting book to research because they're other than the family journal that just talks, just has business entries, there is really very little written statements from the Kadats themselves from up through Michelle and Equesaway. And then after that, we start to get a few more written things from family members. But up through that generation, not a whole lot. In your book, you talk about how the backbone of the shipping in the fur trade was the Montreal Canoe. Yes. Uh, with a crew of eight to 12 voyagers carrying tons of goods on Lake Superior from Montreal to Grand Portage. Do you have any idea how long such a journey took and how often the canoes failed to reach their destinations? It usually took about two weeks to get from Montreal to um, Grand Portage. Well, I should say two weeks to a month, depending on weather. There are reports of several canoes that 
um, were destroyed and men who were lost along the way, either in portages or in, when storms came up on Lake Superior. But I think the people had, the, the voyagers, the traders had come to understand pretty well the dangers of the trip and they were careful. So the vast majority have made it, even, uh, even though they sometimes lost a number of their furs and I have one instance in my book where Jean-Baptiste Cadat Jr lost a whole canoe load of furs going over a portage from Lake Superior down into northern Wisconsin. It did happen, but I think it didn't happen. If it happened too often, it wouldn't have been a profitable business and they wouldn't have kept doing it. So it was a fairly rare occurrence, but it wasn't completely unexpected or unlikely. It happened with some degree of regularity. And which Kadat moved back to Canada? Are you familiar? The Kadats like the name Jean-Baptiste and Michel. This was Jean-Baptiste Kadat, who was the son of Michel and Equesaway, not the son of Jean-Baptiste Kadat Jr., but it was Michel and Equesaway's son, Jean-Baptiste Kadat. Were there many different fur trade posts, and how was it chosen? where a fur trader would trade. Oh yeah, there were lots of different posts around the, well, throughout what's now Michigan's Upper Peninsula, uh, Northern Wisconsin, Northern Minnesota, and then Canada, and eventually into the um, Rocky Mountains in both Canada and the United States. There were posts all over. A lot of those posts were developed um, usually along riverbanks where native peoples traveled, where they could easily connect with natives who were trap and trade, trap furs and then trade for goods. Some places you can read about the um, conflicts from different traders and different individuals. In fact, uh, there is one place in my book where Michel Cadat has uh, not violent, but a definite conflict with traders working for another company. But other places, in fact, the Cadats, both Jean-Baptiste Jr. and Michel, when they worked for the Northwest Company and then later the American Fur Company, had specific lands that were specified in contracts that they had. And some of those contracts still exist and they say exactly for instance, where Michel Cadat was allowed to trade and trap in 1804 and 1805. So I think the large companies tried to be very specific and to avoid the conflicts. It didn't always work. And then when you got out in other locations where there weren't as many ties to the big companies, it was kind of a free-for-all. And in fact, one of the reasons the Northwest Company was formed in the late 18th century is because there was such a free for all in the various locations with different trappers and traders just kind of butting heads at locations. But the posts themselves were usually chosen because they were important locations where Native Americans traveled and could be, would make contact with the Europeans or Euro-Americans. Did your research extend to any continued relationship with the Buffalo family? Um, a little bit, yeah. I, I, in fact, met one of the descendants of um, Chief Buffalo some years ago and uh, did a little bit of research on that. Um, there is some indication that Michel, through his mother's side, I think, had a familial uh, relationship with the Buffalo family. And of course, Chief Buffalo was critical in the helping to get the treaty terms that allow the Ojibwe to stay in northern Wisconsin instead of being moved out to Minnesota as government entities at the time wanted. Um, So I found a little bit of evidence of that and discussed it some. Uh, I I didn't go into great detail about that in the book. Uh, With such extensive amount of research, what was your biggest surprise or misconception that you found? I think the biggest surprise for me was coming to understand how much, how sophisticated 
some of the French Canadian traders like the Cadets had to be, you know, when I first came across them and first read a few things, uh, reading stuff that was written largely by British and Americans, it, it really kind of dismissed or downgraded the French Canadians. You know, they were just drunken voyagers and Catholics. They weren't given a lot of credit, but in fact, they deserve a great deal of credit because they had to work, you know, with the Native Americans and with British or, or American traders and with British and American financiers to get the loans. Because every year that you had to borrow money to get the trade goods and then go out and trade for furs and come back and hope you got enough furs to pay off the loans. The ones that were involved for a long time, like the Kadats, had to be very sophisticated people, even if they were not given credit for that by um, the British and the Americans initially. That was the biggest thing. And then just, I think the uh, coming to understand that the Kadats made this home on Madeline Island, which, you know, I love visiting Madeline Island, but I can't imagine living there year round, even today. And they did it in the late 18th and early 19th century. And, and they could have gone a lot of places. As they grew older, they could have moved to Montreal or, or as a number of traders did, to farms in the upper Canada region. But they didn't. They, they stayed at the west end of Lake Superior. And it's pretty amazing testimony to their fortitude, I think. One more question. Do you know the birth year of the one who moved to Canada, who he married, and where he lived. Mothurin is how it's pronounced, M-A-T-H-U-R-I-N, Cadot, he would have been, C-A-D-O-T, with a French pronunciation. The Cadot family tree that I have it in the beginning of the book lists him as being born in 1649, and he married a woman named Marie Catherine Duran. And after working doing some involvement in the fur trade in the uh, mid 1600s, late 1600s. Then he moved back to the farming region uh, north and east of Montreal and lived on a farm there till his death <clears throat> in 1729. Did the fighting between the Ojibwa and the Dakota or Fox come up in your research? Oh yes, very much so. But it's interesting that the, the Dakota and the Ojibwe were often enemies, but sometimes allies and sometimes traded together and sometimes fought each other. The Fox, not so much. They were generally enemies through the time that we have of recorded documented history of that region. But the Dakota and the Ojibwe, yes, discussions of that fighting came up a lot. Can you speak to the difference in pronunciation of the Kadat name? Yeah. So as I said, the first Kadat to come over here was actually a Kado, and his name was spelled C-A-D-O-T. French pronoun pronunciation, the T is silent. Sometime in the late 18th century, early 19th century, when they were involved with the British, the British saw the T on the end and pronounced it Kadat. And it took over, and you can actually see in the uh, family journals, the business journals, that the name changes from C-A-D-O-T to C-A-D-O-T-T-E right around the turn of the 18th century to the 19th century. The Kadats began using the different spelling apparently to just acknowledge that they might as well go with the British pronunciation since all their business was with the British. But it, it was fairly clear that the, the involvement with the British changed the way the name was pronounced and spelled. That's all the time we have for today. Um, thank you all for the amazing questions. This has been, I think, a really great discussion. And Bob, thank you for all the research and for presenting us with such interesting information today. Well, thank you, Tony, and thank you everyone who was involved for listening to my presentation and asking great questions. Please see our website, 
for information about next month's program. Uh, it's still pending, but we will be putting it out there. And while there, take a look at our 360 tour of our museum or watch a video from our online archive. From all of us at Bayfield Heritage Association, I am so pleased you all came today and thank you for your support. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.